Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, and I am Director of Author Events. By my count, we've hosted tonight's guest at the library more than any other author during my tenure. <laughs> Make that 15 times and counting. And there are lots of good reasons for that. But the most important is that all of her books, from her first novel, Good in Bed, to her YA series, Little Bigfoot, to her recent collection of essays, Hungry Heart, all connect with readers. It's obvious from the bestseller list. It's evident from the crowd here tonight. Her 13th novel, Miss Everything, clearly continues that connection. One blurb called the book Jen's legacy novel. I beg to differ. She's not even halfway through, which is good news for all of you. Please welcome one of our favorite and one of the funniest writers, Jennifer Weiner. Look at all of these people. I was like, nobody's gonna come out. Like everybody's gonna be like either at the shore or in their air conditioning. So I'm so, so happy to be here. I'm so, so happy to be home. Um, I go to Canada tomorrow where they're nice. And, um, <laughs> and it's like super duper disconcerting. Like I was in the Midwest and everybody was, I was in like, where was I? Cedar Rapids and everybody was like so nice and so helpful and like I needed to like do something at the airport so I like go to the gate agent and I'm like expecting to be met with like this the scowl of resistance and, and I walk up to this woman she's like how can I help you I'm just like wait what what and and then she was trying to do something on her computer and it wouldn't work and she's like oh fudge pack fiddlesticks <laughs> I'm like, where am I? <laughs> what happened? So um, the thing about being on book tour, though, is life goes on um, at home. And my book came out on June 11th, which was right about when my 11-year-old um, daughter ended fifth grade. And so for days, like right before the tour started, she's like, did my report card come? I'm like, no. She's like, is my report card there? I'm like, I haven't seen it. She's like, where is my report card? I'm like, bitch, I don't know, okay? Just like, <laughs> enough with the report card. <laughs> Mommy's waiting for her reviews, okay? Like, <laughs> there's only so much I can handle. But so finally, like the day the book comes out, the report card arrives, right? So I open it up and I read the first line, and it said, this spring, Phoebe continued to be a consistent classroom leader. And I'm like, that's good, that's good, that sounds good, right? My kid's a leader, and then I keep reading. A consistent leader in reminding her peers of academic and behavioral expectations. <laughs> She's a snitch! <laughs> So I'm like, Phoebe, what is going on with this? And I like read her the line and she's like, well, I only tell the teachers that they are being very bad. Normally I just will tell them. And I'm like, I'm like, you know snitches get stitches, right? Like, I wanna see how you sign snitches get stitches. Can you? I love it. Thank you, that's a useful one. Um, so yeah, so. Um, Phoebe's actually here tonight. Um, my 16-year-old daughter is not, because she hates me. Um, and everywhere I went, I was like, my 16-year-old daughter who hates me. And finally, somebody took me aside and said, you realize that that's basically like, you know, it's redundant, because like, <laughs> all 16-year-olds, like, I mean, but like, somebody was interviewing me today and they're like, do your kids just think you're so cool? And I'm like, oh no, like, uh-uh. So um, I, I will tell you the story of Lucy. Um, the book came out June 11th and my first event was at a Barnes and Noble in Princeton, New Jersey, like 45 minutes away. So I ask my kids if they wanna go and Phoebe the snitch is like, yes, I will go. What can I do? How can I help? And Lucy, the 16 year old, you know, I'm expecting just her like an eye roll, like not even a word, not even a syllable, just a look. But she's like, yeah, I'll go. And I'm like, she wants something. <laughs> 
I don't know what. I might not know what for a while, but she wants something. So, you know, she gets in the car and, and we get to the bookstore and she's being perfectly pleasant and she's making nice conversation with people and it, it's all going really well. And, and then um, at the end, my, my publicist asked everybody to hold their books up so we could like, you know, take that picture that has to go on Instagram of like everybody holding up their books. And so everybody holds up their books and you know, we take the picture and I post it on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And then I'm in the car on my way to New York for my next stop and my husband texts me and he's like, you might want to look at that picture. And I'm like, oh no. Oh no. So I look at the picture and I'm like looking and looking and I notice that everyone is holding up Mrs. Everything except Lucy, who is holding up a copy of a different book. <laughs> She's holding falsettos, right? Which is like yellow and black and it doesn't match and it just doesn't look right. And so I, I call her and I'm just like, what the hell? And, and she's just like, um, well, you just said to hold up your book. You didn't say to hold up Mrs. Everything. And I wasn't reading Mrs. Everything. So <laughs> classic Lucy, very on brand. Um, and then there's my mom, right? My mom who has she's in the process of selling her house and she has to like keep it looking like really nice and staged and not cook anything that smells bad. So she's decamped to my house in Cape Cod with her stinky cooking. And, um, you know, she's like up there, I'm on book tour, like I'm on my grind, she's at the beach, whatever. Um, and I was in New York City and I was on the Long Island Railroad to go out to like Shorehaven, Long Island because I was doing an event with Susan Isaacs who is like my hero, my idol, like the woman I want to be when I grow up and I'm so nervous, right? Like I'm just going to like fangirl gloop all over her. It's going to be like Chris Farley when, when Paul McCartney was on the Saturday Night Live and he's just like, remember when you were in the Beatles? that was cool. Like I, so I'm just like, I'm on the train and I'm just like, all right, let, let me just like, let me put in my earbuds. Let me like listen to some whale songs. Like, let me get it together. I still have my birth playlist on my, on my iPhone. Like the, the music I was going to listen to, to ease my children into the world. <laughs> that didn't happen. I, I think at Pennsylvania hospital, there are probably nurses who are still laughing at my birth plan. It was 10 pages long. Um, it said that I didn't want any med medical interventions and I wanted low lighting and I wanted my whale song soundtrack to be played. Um, and as much as possible, I didn't want to have an IV so I could be free to bounce on my birth ball. <laughs> my birth, yeah, thank you. How do you do birth ball? Bouncy birth ball. Yes, bouncing on the, thank you, yes. That was going to sort of jerk the child out into the world and like, so, but it's Lucy, so of course like, First of all, bitch is two weeks late, right? <laughs> like, you know, I keep going in for these scans and, and, you know, they're like, do you think you have your dates wrong? And I'm like, no, I don't. Like, and, and, and finally, I, I really, really, really wanted natural childbirth. Like I had taken all of these classes in the Bradley Method and I had read all of these books about like how the female body is designed to do this miraculous thing. And so like, you know, in my head, I'm just like, if I have an epidural, I have failed. I have failed my child before she's even born. And so they're like, you know, this baby is quite large at this point. And they're like, we think you need a C-section. And I'm like, my body was meant to do this miraculous thing. And, and finally, after she's like a solid 13 days late, they, they, they pull me into an office and they tell me, um, we understand that you really, really want natural childbirth, but we have to let you know that your uterine environment is decompensating. <laughs> I'm just like, what does that mean? Like, are the schools getting bad? Like, <laughs> is it the infrastructure? So I schedule a C-section and I go home and I weep. I weep because I believe that I have failed my child already. And then like I'm lying in bed and I can't sleep and I'm crying and my stomach starts to hurt. And then I'm crying some more and my stomach stops hurting and then it starts again. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait one minute. So I'm like, I call the doctor. I'm like, I am in labor. My body is doing the miraculous thing my body was meant to do. I get on my birth ball. I'm like bouncing like crazy. 
I'm like, yep, yeah, see, like crazy. This is happening. This is all happening. I call Fran. She comes down from Connecticut. She's just staring at me like I'm a crazy woman. Um, you know, and, and eventually what happened was after um, 36 hours of unmedicated labor, mm, the doctors are like, um, this, this, this is failing to progress. And, and basically, like, if we let you continue, like, you would be like the woman who's like dead in the, the rice fields and with the child still inside of her. So I'm like, all right, maybe we should do that C-section. So, you know, we do the C-section and it's all just, just very sad and I, I feel like a big failure for, for many years and, and I, I finally get over it. And um, I'm looking at my phone because I'm gonna read you guys something in just a second. Um, so, and then I, four and a half years later, I decide I'm ready to do this again. <laughs> and so I get pregnant with Phoebe and I go in to see the doctor and they're like, so do you wanna try like, you know, the whole vaginal birth after C-section? And I'm like, fuck no. <laughs> I have been in labor enough for five lifetimes. Like, you cut this right out of me. And, and like, you know, we get out our calendars so I can figure out what her, like, astrological sign is going to be. And, like, I get a pedicure. I get a bikini wax. Because, like, you don't want to be that mom. And, and it was wonderful. Like, out she came. It was fantastic. So a little, little digression there. So Fran, my mom, is in Cape Cod. And we're on the Long Island Railroad, and I have my earbuds in, and I'm listening to my whale music, and everything is chill. And then I look across the aisle where my assistant is sitting, and she is looking at her phone, and she is cracking up. She is like convulsed in laughter. So I take out the earbuds, and I'm like, what's going on? And she shows me the transcription of a voicemail, a phone call that we have received. And it says, hi, Jen, this is your neighbor, Karen, um, up in Cape Cod. And I'm calling because I'm really concerned because there are two women on your deck and they keep blowing an air horn. <laughs> and I think they're in some kind of distress. And so like, can you find out like what's going on? So. I, I text my mom and I'm like, why are you standing on my deck blowing an air horn? And she writes back one word, because my mom is not a very proficient texter. She writes back, foxes. <laughs> so I'm like, what foxes? So I call her and she explains to me that at some point in March or April, a fox had a litter underneath the pool deck, right? And there were nine little foxes running around. And I guess that foxes are like super cute when they're young, they're like adorable, but then as they get older and bigger and become hateful teenagers, <laughs> they start doing really bad things like killing rodents and like strewing them about your property. And so my mom called the like animal control office and she's like, what do I do about these foxes? And they explained that the foxes will leave on their own. Like this is what they do. They sort of, they're born, they become hateful teenagers and then they're like, they, they peace out so, and they leave. They go live somewhere else. And so they tell my mom like, you can just wait for this to happen or if they're really, really bothering you, you can annoy them until they leave. <laughs> Hence the air horn. And so I'm like, why don't you and Claire just go stand on the deck and try to figure out what movie to see for 45 minutes? Because like, that always makes me want to leave. And I think the foxes wouldn't appreciate it either. But I just need you to picture this with me, okay? Like two um, sort of gray-haired gray elderly lesbians standing on a pool deck with super soakers and an air horn trying to get the foxes out of my house. And I'm on book tour. I can't do shit, you know? I just got to hope that this is all going to unfold the way it's supposed to. And I think it did, because by the time I got up there for my one night in Cape Cod, there were no more foxes. There were no more foxes. So. Um, I wanted to ask you guys for some help because I'm going to be on Canadian TV on Thursday. They have a show like The View that's called The Social and I'm going to be like one of the, the people. And the hot topics, they gave me two hot topics that they're going to be discussing. One is, should men be invited to baby showers? <laughs> and the second is, um, should sex toys be sold at um, mass market realtors like Walmart? 
all right? So I just, I just, I think I know, I think I know how I feel about both of these things, right? Like, my first feeling is that like, if women have to suffer through baby showers, then men should have to suffer through them as well. Yes, if, if we have to, you know, pretend to be really impressed with the diaper cakes and, you know, the guess the baby's weight games, like, and I think they would be shorter too and, and possibly with more liquor. So I'm, I'm all about men at baby showers. And the second thing is like, Walmart sells guns, right? So like, if you have something that could kill somebody, I think you absolutely can sell something that will bring somebody to orgasm. <laughs> Yes. Just my two cents from America. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm really glad to be doing this now because my guess is that some of you guys might have read the book and you can ask me, thank you, yes, I'm excited. But, um, so I, th I thought we could do a lot of Q&A, but I also wanted to tell you a little bit about the story behind the story and, and the story of where this book came from. Um, and our story begins with the 2016 election, right? So there I am. And yes, I, we can all just, just take a moment. It was, it was, I mean, I had brought my daughters to the voting booth, right? I thought that we were going to be entering this triumphant new phase of America. And I wake up the next, I, I didn't even wake up the next morning. I don't think I went to sleep. And, you know, I think that a lot of people who are in the entertainment world sort of did a gut check after 2016. And at least for myself, I'm thinking, I write, you know, I write fun, light, sort of breezy, somewhat frothy books. And I, I know that they deal with serious issues, but I also think that they are, they're entertainment and they're fun. And is that what I should be doing at this moment in our nation's tortured history? And I thought and I thought, and what I decided that I needed to be doing at this moment in time was writing a dark, dystopian novel set in the near future in a world where fertility treatments and abortion and contraception were all illegal. In other words, Georgia. <laughs> Although I didn't know it was, it wasn't Georgia quite yet. And so, you know, I have this idea that I want to write a book about reproductive rights and I start researching sort of the underground abortion railroads that existed in the 60s and the 70s before Roe versus Wade. And I come up with an outline and I come up with characters and I write and I write and I write for a year and a half and I cannot make this book work. And I think looking back, there's something that the novelist Tayari Jones, who wrote in American Marriage says, she says, novels have to be about people, not problems. And I think looking back that the book that I was trying to write was about problems and not people. I was trying, I, the issue came before the characters did. So I had to, um, you know, it took me a long time. I didn't want to realize that it was sort of like a dead book, but it was a dead book. And I had to like put it in a box and put it away and then think, what do I do now? And a story I'd always wanted to tell was a version of my own mother's life. And some of you guys might know this from Hungry Heart or from Good in Bed or from reading my blog or from previous speaking engagements. But real briefly, the story of my mother is um, she was born in Detroit in the 1940s. She went to the University of Michigan in the 1960s. She married a man, as you did back then, and moved to the suburbs of Connecticut and had four children. Um, and my dad left in the 80s, sort of decided he didn't want to be a husband or a father anymore and um, told the four of us that we could think of him as a fun uncle, which was super weird, super weird. And then we really didn't see very much of him. And my mom was more or less a single mother for 10 years as we sort of went from kids to teenagers to young adults. And then in, um, in 1996, my youngest brother, Joe, 
who was taking a leisurely path through his college education. He was on like the six year plan at the University of Connecticut and he went home to do his laundry and he calls me up and I'm a reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer at the time, right? And I'm on the features desk. I pick up the phone. I'm like, features, this is Jennifer. And it's my brother, Joe. And he's like, there's a woman living in the house. And I'm like, say what now? And he's like, there are shoes, and they are a woman's shoes, and they are not Fran's shoes. And there are self-help books in the bookcase, and they are not Fran's self-help books. And I went into mom's bathroom to borrow toenail clippers, and I found love letters from a woman signed Karen. Um, and you need to call mom and find out what's going on. Yes, I'm the oldest in case you didn't guess that. So I call my mom and I'm like, hey, what's new? <laughs> right, I'm gonna give her the opening. And she's like, she's like, nothing, nothing. And I'm like, oh, um, well, Joe went home to um, clip his toenails and um, <laughs> Yeah, actually, I think the first thing I did even before I called my mother was like, I went and bought Joe his own toenail clippers because like this whole thing could have been avoided. <sighs> Cut your damn toenails, right? So I, I'm like, you know, Joe says there's these shoes and there's these books and there's these letters and there's a pause. And then my mother says, um, oh yes, well, there is a woman who's um, moved into the house. She's my swim coach. I'm like, swim coach? I'm like, it's not an Olympic year, Fran. <laughs> what is going on here? And she says, okay, all right. Well, um, that is, her name is Karen, and she's the aquatics director at the West Hartford JCC, and we've been on two dates, and we're in love, and she's moved in. Bye. <laughs> and I'm holding the phone, and I'm thinking, what the fuck just happened? Like, like, who even are you, Fran? You know, and, and what, like, did you want to be married to a guy ever and, like, have four kids and live in the suburbs? Like, I, you know, what was it like? And for a long time, most of my answers were kind of jokey ones. Like, there is a gay mom who shows up in Good in Bed who is mostly there for comic relief. And when I wrote the book, I gave the manuscript to my mother and I said, you know, I didn't write this to hurt you or upset you and I'll change anything you want to change except the name of the all women softball team, Nine Women Out. <laughs> Everyone likes that. Um, but as the years went on and as I became a mother myself, um, I started to think um, a little more deeply and perhaps sympathetically about what it must have been like for my mom. Um, knowing that, you know, when she was in her 20s, homosexuality was still considered a mental disorder. And you, you know, as women, there weren't a lot of places where you could be out. Um, and even if you weren't out, like you couldn't have a credit card, you couldn't get a mortgage in your own name. Like there were all of these sort of constrictions on the lives of women that I learned about as I researched this book. And I began to think um, what it must have been like for her. And I always wanted to write a big sweeping kind of birth to death and beyond kind of book that considered a whole arc of history. So I thought there'll be a character sort of like my mom and then I'll give her a sister because I'm always interested in sister stories and sister dynamics. I'll give her a sister and the sister will be the good girl. The sister will be the straight one, um, the pretty one, the popular one, the one who just wants to get along and be accepted and be loved. And I will show what the world does to women, what it does to women whether you follow the rules or you break them, and how no matter what you do and no matter what path you take, it's impossible to have it all, as they say, and there's always some sacrifice and there's always some pain. Um, Somebody asked me at one of the events that I did, she's like, you know, you're, you're so hard on these characters, like such terrible things happened to both of them, and, you know, and why did you do that? And I said, you know, I, 
I didn't really think about these are horrible things. I, I thought like, these are the things that happen to women as we go through life, you know? And I was very much writing this book sort of right in the middle of the Me Too movement and where sort of every day it was like you were learning about another horrible man and the horrible things that he had done. And I, I never want to write issue books. Like, I never want to write polemics. I never want readers to feel like they're trapped with somebody who is standing on a soapbox, beating them over the head with her own politics. However, as I wrote this book, like, the politics just showed up. And it, it turned out that, like, the book that I wanted to write, the dystopian book, the book that was going to be about women and freedom, like, that's what Mrs. Everything sort of turned into, like, almost unbeknownst to me. It turned into a story about women and choice and the roads we can take and the roads we can't and where we've been and where we've gotten and where we still need to go. Um, and I, it's, the, the, the big question that people ask is, has your mother read this book? <laughs> because when I finished it, I went to my publisher's office in New York, and there were a bunch of new people that I was working with there that I hadn't met before. So I'm like, you know, hey, I'm Jen. And they're like, oh, you know, the book is really, really good. We all just really love the book. And I'm like, thank you. And they're like, and the sex scenes are amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you? Because basically, you know, it, it involved like imagining a, a mother, a version of my mom having a version of sex with a person. And like, it was weird. It was hard to do. But, <laughs> and then I had to give the book to Fran. And um, so she comes to my house for Passover and there's like a big stack of the advanced reader's copies. So I, I can't like stall anymore. I can't tell her, oh no, it's still at the printers because it's not. So I, I wait until Sunday, which is the day she's going home. And I give her the book and she starts to read. And I'm thinking, please, Fran, hit the road before you hit page 97. <laughs> I cannot be in the same house with you when you get to that scene. And so finally, like, she and Claire leave, you know, they're, they're driving off, and then my phone dings, and my mom has texted me, and she says, I did not drop acid at Woodstock. Don't know why anyone would think I am Bethy. And I'm like, yeah, wrong sister. You're not Bethy, Joe. But... So, you know, when I was at Cape Cod, the one night that I was there with the foxes, my mom was just like, you know, like, I'm just telling everybody my daughter has a great imagination. <laughs> and I'm like, you do you, Fran. Like, if that, if that works, like, that's, that's great. So, you know, that's my mom's line. My daughter has a great imagination. You talk about um, harshness with the way you're treating your characters. Mm -hmm. And that kind of reminds me of um, criticism that Gillian Flynn gets. Mm -hmm. And I, I was curious what your feelings are about her and if, if you identify with that or you distinguish yourself from... About Gillian kind of Flynn, about like yeah. Gone Girl and, that, and those kinds of books? Yeah, like, you know, she, she's sort of um, kind of divisive about looking like she's not a feminist, but ultimately she claims to be one. Huh. I mean, I guess from my own perspective, there's a line, um, I think it was by Salinger, a quote from Salinger who said like, an author has to love his characters more than God, right? Like you've created them and it's hard to sort of put them through stuff. And I'm, you know, I, I imagine it was hard for Gillian Flynn or for anybody who sort of writes a book that has that level of, um, of deceptiveness and also gore, you know? Um, but I mean, I, I believe, there's, there's also another quote that I think about all the time, and it's from the, the poet and activist Muriel Rukeyser, who says, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life, the world would crack open? And I believe that you can tell truth, even in fiction. And I think that, um, if you're writing honestly, like you, you end up having something to say about women. 
whether you call yourself a feminist or not, whether you consider your characters feminists or not, like I think that any book that's honest is going to sort of help the progress along. So I hope that answered. Yeah, um, hi. hi. I um, have enjoyed reading your pieces that you've submitted in the opinion section of the Times, and I was wondering if maybe you've ever thought about writing a book of essays about various um, topics. Well, I wrote a book of essays. Um, it, it was published in 2016, and it was called Hungry Heart. Um, there's a hostess cupcake on the paperback cover. Can't miss it. But I, I really love writing nonfiction, and I would like to do more of it. Um, and, and the thing is, my mother, again, to go back to her, she's like, you know, Jenny, I like your novels, but I really love your essays. And I'm just like, thanks, you know? It's like, but I, I do love, um, love writing them. And it's a funny story how that all began. Like, I used to write for The Inquirer, and I wrote opinion pieces, and I wrote features, and I loved being a newspaper reporter. Like, I loved the immediacy of it, and I loved the you know, being relevant and being timely and sort of being like right in the mix and having something to say. Um, and, and then I became a novelist and I sort of um, had a Twitter feed which somewhat replaced my desire for journalism because it felt a little bit like I can be timely, I can be provocative, I can comment on what's going on in the world. And um, what happened was my Nana moved into assisted living. And after she'd been there a couple days, I called her and I'm like, how's it going? And she's like, well, I can't get into a bridge game. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, no one wants me at their table in the cafeteria. And I'm just like, holy shit, there are mean girls in the retirement home. <laughs> like, it never ends. I'm gonna be 96 and no one's gonna wanna sit with me at lunch. Like, this is terrible. So I tweet, I get on Twitter and I tweet, can't believe there are mean girls in my Nana's retirement home. And some editor at the New York Times sees that tweet and like direct messages me, like slides into my DMs and is like, can you write about this for us? And I'm like, indeed I can. Um, <laughs> And, and it, was, it was great. I went, I like interviewed Nana, I interviewed Aunt Marlene, it was fantastic. So I, I encourage all of you, for anyone who says social media is a waste of time, it's not. It got me a job. So everybody tweet. Yes. My name's Kellen and I really love your work. Thank um, you. It's very important in my life. Um, as you say, you're a mother of two girls. Mm -hmm. I am a mother of two um, very little girls as well, and mm -hmm. I was wondering what advice or suggestions do you have for helping raise them in a world that is so hard on women? Yeah, suggestions for raising girls. <laughs> um, why is everyone laughing? This is, this is, hurt, this is hurtful to me. Um, okay, um, let's see. Don't say bad things about yourself in front of them. Don't think bad things about yourself in front of them. <laughs> very hard, very hard. Um, don't sit down at the table and say, oh, I was so bad last night, I'm just gonna have some chicken broth. Like, don't turn food into something, food and bodies into something that is sort of laden with judgment and good and bad. Um, I would say, Model the life that you want them to live, which means a lot of faking it till you make it. Like, honestly, it does. Like, even if you don't feel confident, you, I think you have to sort of portray confidence because that's what you want them to see. And even if you are hesitant about speaking up about something, you should do it because you want them to always speak up. Um, I was doing an interview today and, and somebody asked me about advice, like the best advice that I'd gotten. And I thought about the advice that my mother gave me, which is don't pick it about zits. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was kind of it. Oh, and bet, always use a bigger bowl than you think you need when you're cooking. That also <laughs> advice, advice from Fran. Better a bowl too big, says my mother. But I, I thought about like, 
whenever, whenever I've like edited a project and I get submissions from men and from women, and I send back a note, like my rejection letter basically says, this isn't quite right for us. Thank you for thinking of us. Please submit again, right? And I honest to God think that the only part of the letter that the women hear is, this is not right for us. And the only part the men hear is submit again, because like <laughs> five minutes later, I will have literally like five other pitches in my inbox. Like, they don't quit because they are confident and they believe that they have something to say because the world tells them that they do. And the world is still a little ambivalent about telling women that they have something worthy to say. So, yes. So, I, w I mean, we're living in a really hard time time we're living th what I through a really hard time right now um, where a president can be credibly accused of rape and and his response will be she's not my type and we're we've become so numb and so inured to this that it's just like you know for any other president this would be the scandal of the administration and for Trump it's Tuesday and I, I think that, um, I mean, honestly, like my biggest piece of advice is speak truth to power. And if you see something, say something. And if, if you believe that there's injustice or unfairness or inequity, point it out. Because I don't want my girls thinking that it's normal for women to be less than, or to have to be quieter, or deferential, or smaller, or take up less space, right? Like, I want my girls to take up space in the world and believe that their voices have value. And that is what I try to model for them, even if I don't feel like, you know, even if I don't feel brave, even if I don't feel outspoken, even if I just don't want to get beat up on social media for saying something that I know will get me beaten up on social media. Do it anyhow. And I think if we do it and we do it and we do it, that's going to move the needle of normal and that will change the world. <laughs> Hashtag eloquent. <laughs> Thank you, that was a good question. No, because I think about that all the time, right? Like, I think about the armor that women have to put on just to, like, walk down the street, you know, knowing that, like, you're going to get looked at and you're going to get yelled at and you're, you know, just, just the, all of the tiny little adjustments and defenses that we have to do and, and put on just to move through the world. So... You know, be brave even if you don't feel brave. I believe I'm your real friend, even though I'm your Facebook friend. That's okay. I, and though many of my friends uh, say that we're, we're all friends with you, but I'm, okay. Su I'm Susan Zaslow. Hi, Susan. So we go sometimes back and forth. Um, I'm sure I'm one of many. My daughter just said, please. Don't embarrass me. Right. So, well, um, yeah, I'm sure my so, daughter's out there somewhere just like So cringing. I've done my job, right. So I just <laughs> wanted to add on what you said. Um, because I feel the same way to learn to help your girls self. I have two uh, children, two older children, uh, girls and a boy, and um, help them self-advocate. Mm -hmm. And when you are not brave, I tell them, and I'm doing it anyway. Yep. And that sometimes is really hard. Um, or I'm not brave and I'm not doing it and I wish I had. Yeah. Um, but for the advice for the little girls with the mom, um, listen more than you speak. Let them have problems and fix them themselves. Oh, that's a good one, yeah. right. We used to assign like a scale. So I said if it's a one to a four, it's you. If it's a four to a seven, we'll talk, I'll secretly email the teacher right. without telling yeah. you. Right, yeah. And if that, you know, B, as you would say, is bothering my kid and it's a 10, I'm, I'm on it. So right. Right. that's no, how I, we did it. I think that's great. I mean, I think that like giving girls 
and boys, but giving them agency, right? And letting them know that they're capable of like being their own advocates and solving their own problems. Like at um, the Hateful Teenager School, they had a meeting for all of the parents whose girls were doing sports and they said, if your kid has, if you have a problem with like how often your kid is being played or what position she's been put in or whatever it is, parents are not allowed to talk to the coaches, right? Like it was just a hard, bright line. Your kid can go talk to the coach, but you as a parent cannot do that unless, you know, obviously like, you know, your kid like lost a limb in the volleyball game. You might want to say something about that. But I, I loved that because I, I loved the idea of like teaching girls to be their own advocate right? And not waiting for somebody to ride to the rescue and fix it for them. And, and just learning, you know, the, the difficult sometimes process of saying something's wrong here and I need you to help me fix it. So I think that's excellent advice. So God, we should just have like a support group. This is fantastic. Are you, and um, when you had your film, the film come out, right, in her shoes. Mm -hmm. What was your um, connection to writing in terms of the screenplay? What mm -hmm. was that like for you working with, you know, famous actors? But just if you could talk about process in terms yes, of your okay. different genres. So, that you ab absolutely. With. Okay, so um, many, many books get optioned and never, ever get made into actual movies. And I was very realistic when In Her Shoes was optioned, I was like, this is probably not going to happen. I am going to cash the check and move on to my next book. And then my brother, Jake, not Joe, the toenail clipper guy, but Jake, <laughs> slightly more together. Um, he's a producer in Hollywood and he was working on the project and he would call me and he, he would say, um, Curtis Hansen wants to direct. And I would be like, whatever. And, you know, he would say, Susanna Grant wants to write the screenplay. And I would just be like, all right, you know, and I, my attitude was basically like, call me on the first day they actually start shooting. And then I will believe that this is happening because so many things have to line up so perfectly for something to get made. You have to have all of the people from the producer, the director, the screenwriter, the stars, the funding, all of that on board and all of the people free at the same time. And it's a very, very hard needle to thread. And the way In Her Shoes came together, it was really like almost magical. It happened very, very fast. Um, the director, the screenwriter, the stars, you know, and then it was like the first day of principal photography. And I'm like, well, I guess this is actually happening. Um, and my attitude, like, I was super duper zen for like once in my sad life. I was just like, I was mentally okay with something. I was just like, I told the story that I wanted to tell on the page. This is going to be their story to tell on the screen. And I don't really know how to like do a movie. It's a different skill set. So I am just going to like stand back and support them as much as I can and hope for the best and know that if it's a great movie, that's fantastic. And even if it's not a great movie, that's going to bring people to the book. You know, so I, I just sort of took like a giant step back and I was like working on other projects and other books and it ended up happening. And it ended up happening really, really well, which makes me an extremely, extremely lucky writer. Um, and a couple of years after the movie came out, I did an event um, in Cape Cod. It was a fundraiser for a homeless shelter for abused women. And it was full of very, very fancy junior league ladies, like all dressed up at this like beautiful inn on the sea with this view and there was a tent. And so it was me, um, Claire Cook, Jackie Michard and Alice Hoffman. And it was all of us who'd had books made into movies. And so the director of the events explained how it was going to work. She's like, I'm going to show a clip of each of the movies, and then, all, then whoever's movie that is is going to discuss it and, you know, what it was like. So she shows a clip of, oops, of Claire Cook's movie, Must Love Dogs. And um, Claire Cook talks about publishing her first book at 50 and what it was like to, you know, be on the set and walk the red carpet. 
And then she shows a clip of Jackie Michard's book, Deep End of the Ocean. And Jackie talks about being an Oprah pick and what that was like and you know, meeting Michelle Pfeiffer and how amazing that was. And then she shows a clip of In Her Shoes and I talk about what it was like having my Nana be an extra in the movie and like how, no, really, this, this happened. It was like, it was, it was my big like shot at redemption, you know, cause like Nana was really upset about the gay thing and like, you know, she was being much nicer to the other cousins, you know? So I'm just like, well, this is, this is my shot, right? Like, you know, and I call her and I'm like, you know, Nana, they're, they're, they're shooting parts of In Her Shoes in Florida, you know, would you like to be an extra? And she's like, I'll think about it. I'm just like, damn gay mother ruins everything. But, you know, it was, it was amazing. Um, and, and so I talk about how amazing it was and, and how, you know, they, they did this big, like, after party in Hollywood at Spago, and my Nana was there with me, and a man asked for my mom's phone number, and my Nana was, like, over the moon about it, and, like... <laughs> She was like, you see that, Francis? You see, if you just wear a little lipstick, <laughs> can get right back in the game. <laughs> True story. And then they show a, a clip of Practical Magic, which is Alice Hoffman's book. Um, and it's the, um, it's the scene where Sandra Bullock and Nicole Kidman are in their white nighties, and they are drinking, and they are dancing to the song, Put the Lime into Coconut not in the book, was not in the book. And the lights come up and Alice Hoffman leans into her microphone in front of this audience of fancy ladies and says, I fucking hated that movie. <laughs> and we're all just like, oh shit, like. <laughs> She did, she hated it. And you know, I mean, like I think of like the books that I love and like the, the disaster, the disastrous movies that some of them became. So I'm really lucky. And I, I mean, if something else gets adapted, that'll be wonderful. But it's like, it's such a high bar to cross because I, I got, you know, a really faithful adaptation that was made really respectfully. They shot it in Philadelphia. Like, they didn't, like, go to Canada where everything's cheaper with, like, a styrofoam Liberty Bell, <laughs> which they could have done. So I'm really pleased. And, and my process was stay the fuck out of it and just let, let them do the thing. And that, I think, was smart. And that would be the advice I would give to other writers is just, like, let, you know, unless you have specific expertise. Because that's the other thing I can tell you. There are novelists who have tried to adapt their own material and have lost years of their lives writing screenplays for movies that were never made. So from my own perspective, it's just better to write the next book. A talent for writing wonderful sex scenes. Yes. So um, I'm curious, and I think you touched on this in, in Canny's um, story, what it's been like raising two daughters. But I also think this goes to the earlier question about the Me Too movement and mm -hmm. the stories of Trump and Brett Kavanaugh and how important it might be to raise those um, conversations with young women. So if you could talk about that. Yeah, I mean... It's so funny, because I honestly was giving some serious thought to the question about vibrators in Walmart. <laughs> like, you know, because of course I had my answer, you know, about if they have guns, they should have, you know, rabbits or whatever, like they should. <laughs> but I, I was also thinking, like, what sex ed is like in this country, and it's basically like, do not have sex because you will get diseases and you will get pregnant and you will die. Right? Like, wasn't that pretty much sex ed for like most of us? Like, does anyone remember pleasure being discussed anywhere in sex ed? Like, I sure don't. It was all like, don't get pregnant, you know? And like, no birth control is 100%. Is and, you know, it was scary. And it, it made sex sound scary. And, you know, like, bad things would happen if you did it. And like, so I. I always have sex scenes in my book. And I will tell you the reason is that when I was like 12 and 13 and 14, I would read Susan Isaacs and I would read Judith Krantz and I would read Shirley Conran, who wrote Lace, which was made into the miniseries where Phoebe Cates says, which one of you bitches is my mother, right? Timeless, classic. <laughs> but all of those, Phoebe, put your earmuffs, earmuffs, Phoebes. 
Um, all of those books had orgasms in them. All of those books had women having orgasms in realistic fashions, i.e. not the second the hero looked at them, right? <laughs> like other stuff had to happen before you got the orgasm and that was important for me to learn as a young person. So I, I always have um, fairly detailed sex scenes in my book because I want young women who read them to know that pleasure is their right. And that sex is not just something that you give or you withhold and your main concern is thinking, I, I better not get pregnant and I better not get sick. Like other countries, they teach kids about pleasure, like in, in Norway and Denmark and all of those super progressive places, except I just saw Midsommar, so now I'm like afraid of them. <laughs> all of those super progressive places where they like throw their old people off cliffs. <laughs> Sorry, spoiler, if you, if you haven't seen it. But I mean, honest to God though, their sex ed talks about like, masturbation and orgasms and, and pleasure. And we don't teach our kids about that. We don't teach our girls about that. And I think that we should. And I, yes, thank you. So, I mean, like I, I joke that like everything I learned about sex, I learned from Harlequins and Jackie, and, and Jackie Collins and Judith Krantz. And someday, young women will say, everything I learned about sex, I learned from Jennifer Weiner. And, and, and yes, and in my grave, in my grave, I will be so proud. All right, I am gonna go sign all of your books. I will answer any questions. I'll sign body parts. We'll take pictures. Thank you, guys.